Hi, I'm welcome for everyone. Today is, we have a great session. We have a very unique guest. Uh, Ryan uh, will be with us. He's one of the only 20 Cicerone in the world. And uh, he will share his experience and thoughts with us. Uh, welcome, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Excited to talk beer. Welcome to Perfect Beer Talks. Uh, I have so many things to talk with you. I'm very excited for today's session. Let's start with, uh, it's, I know it's very difficult to describe one of the masters, Sharon. Let's look at what, what's your journey? How did you enter the beer industry? And sure. how it's going to be master Sharon? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, I mean, for those listeners that aren't familiar with uh, what a Cicerone is, Basically, the easiest way to describe it is what a sommelier is to wine, is what a Cicerone is to beer. Um, there are four different levels, the fourth and uh, highest level being Master Cicerone. So that's the one I was able to achieve back in 2017. But I've been in the beer industry for over 17 years. So I worked for a wholesaler in the United States. I worked for a brewery and sales. I worked a lot of time in marketing. And then I moved into an education-based role with Anheuser-Busch back in 2014. So this is where I really got to accelerate my own learning, my own knowledge, my own kind of journey into and through the world of beer. Um, and that's really when I started to kind of study, train, learn a lot more, and start to go through some of these more advanced levels of uh, Cicerone certification. Right. It was quite interesting to listen to your story. Now, if you allow me, uh, I want to dig down a, a little bit more. With your experience, I believe you are the guy for this question. What is like to work in different positions in beer industry and what were the fundamental differences you observe? And finally, which of those do you like most? Yeah, so it, it's interesting. You know, if I think about sales, a lot of it comes down to who you're talking to, who your audience is, who your customer is. Right. So if you're in sales and you're trying to sell somebody, you know, a new beer, a new package, the things that they're looking for might be very different than um, when you're just trying to market directly to a consumer. Right. If you're trying to sell somebody something, they want to know the price and how many how much of it they can sell. Uh, what is it going to do for them? Uh, marketing, uh, definitely much more of a creative space. So I really enjoyed working uh, primarily in brand management. So you get to do a lot of fun things with packaging design, uh, commercial development, things like that, but still really tough. It's kind of this nice combination of what we would say is art and science. So how do you really understand the market and the analytics, but then bring some new excitement, creativity to it? Uh, I was definitely much more of a fan of the art than the science, which is maybe I, why I wasn't the best marketer. I, I don't know. Um, and then ultimately, education excuse me, is by far my favorite because whoever I'm talking to, whether it be somebody on the sales side, the marketing side, the service side, I think everybody just likes to learn more about the things that they're touching, engaging around on a daily basis. So most of those people have some sort of connection to beer. So the more they learn about it, whether that be raw ingredients or the brewing process or how it tastes or the beer styles, their overall level of appreciation goes up. And that's ultimately what I get a lot of kind of personal benefit from. Like I love seeing other people, people kind of get on this same journey that I've been on throughout my, my experience and throughout my time in the industry. Um, because every time they then go to crack a beer, order a pint of beer, they're going to be thinking a little bit more um, specifically about what went into it, what am I tasting? And just the overall experience is going to be that much better. Do you remember that, that did you drink your first beer? In which <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I'll, I'm a little fuzzy on the age, but I'm sure it was on my 21st birthday in the United States. Um, <laughs> it's too uh, late, right? Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. But, you know, it's interesting for me, you know, when I started drinking beer, when I was younger, um, you know, I, I definitely drank a lot of lighter lagers, you know, American lagers, uh, things like that. Um, you know, bitterness is an acquired taste for a lot of people. So, you know, I wasn't somebody that started drinking pale ales and IPAs, but 
you know, it's interesting how your palate evolves over time. And, you know, I still drink a lot of those, those pale lighter lagers, but basically now I'll drink everything. Um, you know, it just kind of goes back to as you kind of expose yourself and your taste buds and your palate to all these different experiences, sometimes there might be a little bit of a shock effect, but once you kind of get over that hump and you start to like really understand what you truly enjoy and what you don't, there's really, there's no shortage of options that beer is going to bring to the table or to the glass. So uh, started drinking kind of one type of beer and now I basically drink it all. All right. I, I was 15 when I, when I drink the, my first beer. Yeah. Uh, it was like a, in a tea glass. And yeah. I was feel not good in that time anyway uh your words remind me something uh, i i actually want to dig on that point i love beer history and philosophy mm -hmm. as we all know in the civilization history beer has a important role in sure in the world war two or other things uh i want to ask you even though beer has thousands of years history, lagers are dominating the beers uh, in, let's say, in last 100 years. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about that as a social, sociologic way? What is the main reason behind of it? Yeah, well, you know, definitely to your point, um, you know, beer has evolved in a lot of different ways over uh, millennia. And then if we kind of look more recently to the last few centuries, you know, even a lot of new developments, we think about hops, right? Hops is a key ingredient in beer. You know, that's a relatively new ingredient in terms of the full lifespan of how long beer has been around. Um, and then just better understanding around technology, science, yeast, fermentation, all these things. But, you know, going back to your question around lagers, if we kind of look at you know, what some people would refer to as like the lager revolution or the Pilsner revolution when the Pilsner style was created in 1840s in Czech Republic. You know, I think it's just a beer style that's got a lot going on for it, right? It looks good. It's got this brilliant level of clarity, bright gold color. You know, you get a lot of nice malt character, you get some hop character, you get some fermentation character. Uh, the bitterness is pronounced without being overly aggressive. It's got a lighter body, a drier finish. So it's really just a lot of these great characteristics from a, a flavor and tasting perspective in one package. And then certainly as you start to, to bring in the company side of it, the brand side of it is, you know, larger breweries start focusing on those types of styles. You're just going to start to get a little bit of traction in the market and uh, things kind of spiral from there. But it's interesting too, where it wasn't just beer. You know, if we look at least in the US where I live, you know, coming out of prohibition in the 50s, 60s, there was a lot of, you know, I don't know if homogenization is the right word, but uh, kind of like fewer brands, fewer flavors, like fewer brands in each of these different categories, whether it be bread, cheese, beer. And then as we start to get the resurgence of craft brewing in the U.S. around the, you know, probably late 70s, but more into the early 80s, mid 80s, all these other styles start to pop up. So you have all these people that didn't necessarily have the opportunity to experience brown ales and pale ales and amber ales. Um, but once they start to spend a little time with them, they start to understand that there's a lot of different options for them. So I still think lager beers are, are fantastic. You know, one of the things that we try to educate people on, though, is lager is not one style of beer, right? Lager is basically a whole family of beer styles. So it could be a Pilsner or a Pilsner style beer, which is kind of the most common style we find across the, the globe. But it could be something like a Schwartz beer. Uh, a black beer out of Germany. It could be a Doppelbach, um, could be a Baltic Porter, could be a Helles. So, so many different options within the lager family, um, but Pilsners, Pilsner style beers are still pretty solid, pretty, pretty good drinking experience. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons why it's done so well. 
Uh, it's, a, it's a very informful and great answer. Thanks for it. Uh, actually, you know, uh, everybody trying to say that hey, beer is us. To Germany, England, mm -hmm. US. You know, everybody has their own culture, especially about beer. Sure. I, love it. I love it, by the way. In that point, uh, you are more experienced than in US market. Uh, what do you think about the three tire system? Uh, when it comes, and uh, especially uh, not in the commercial side, of course, in the commercial side, it creates different players, but mm -hmm. uh, in the beer taste and beer flavor and beer type side, how three tire system affects the US beer market? Yeah, so the three-tier system, and for anybody listening that's not familiar, you know, for the most part, you have suppliers or breweries that produce or brew, and then they sell their, their products to wholesalers or distributors who then go out into their individual markets and will sell to bars, restaurants, convenience stores, grocery stores. Um, you know, having worked for both, basically all three levels, because I've worked at... Um, bars and restaurants in my, my college days. Um, I, I think it's good. I think you have more people on the street that give more dedicated attention to the individual accounts. Um, you know, there's so many different brands and products now that the distributors portfolios have become quite vast. So I know it's certainly a challenge for them to manage. But when we think about at the end of the day, like good variety, good options across uh, a tap list, across a, a store shelf. Um, I think it's nice because a lot of different brands are getting representation because you have a lot of different players that are out there selling. It's not just one or two big players that can control everything. Um, you know, on the, on the opportunity side, the challenge there is for a brewery, you know, you're, you have somebody else handling your, your beer before it even gets to market, right? And as you know, like beer is a sensitive product. You know, it can it can go bad in a number of ways. Um, so you can have kind of an extra layer of protection, but you're also relying very heavily on that uh, mid tier to do the do the beer, do the product justice, um, not only in their own warehouses but in their respective markets as well. Gotcha. Thanks, boy. Right. For me, beer is the hope for the sustainable crisis, actually. You know, uh, we are in a very serious term about the sustainable crisis. Um, the main reason behind of it for me, for example, let's think about this. The cotton coming from India, the bottom coming from, let's say, Poland. Uh, and uh, it's all merged in India and it's selling in Istanbul. Oh yeah, what a sustainable decrease. Yeah. Beer is totally contrast for it. Mostly, let's say, for example, Heineken or ABI. They have many factories in different parts of the world and they are producing the beer in the main part of, for example, for Spain, they can have different factories and they are producing there, they are selling there. Uh, so beer is hope for the sustainable crisis for me, and it's a model. Yeah, where you where you consume, you should produce it. Uh, very serious days are waiting us. So yep. that's why one of the reasons I believe the beer. And uh, as we all know, uh, draft beer is one of the greatest part of it. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, how do you see the future of draft beer consumption except on trade? Do you have any predictions draft beer consumption in home near? Future? Yeah, you know, it's in home, at least in the US. Uh, and probably, you know, with the last few years in COVID, a lot of people have kind of shifted to at home drinking. Right. Um, you know, I know just a lot of my friends have put in kegerators at their house. You know, you get like a really nice, fresh draft beer experience at home. 
So I think in terms of the draft beer experience at at home, you know, I could see more and more people continuing to to invest in equipment, a system, something where they get a draft spirit, draft experience um, without even leaving their house, which I, I think is great. There's certainly some financial investment that that goes into that to, to be set up with a even a you know one tap kegerator. You know, I'm not necessarily sure. I know a lot of companies have come out with kind of these smaller draft systems. I haven't seen anything that's really stuck. So it's it's tough for me to say. Um, but, you know, I certainly see it as an opportunity. I don't know what the solution is, but as more people continue to find ways to better enjoy their at-home experience and how beer plays into that, um, you know, hopefully draft beer has a role there and it's not just bottle and can. Um, you know, because fresh draft beer, well poured pint of draft beer is uh, certainly a thing of beauty. In that point, I would love to ask a master Cicerone, can you compare bottled, canned and draft beer? What are the similarities and differences? And personally, which one is your favorite and why? Yeah, uh, I would say if I have a preference and all things are considered same beer, it's, it's well maintained, it's well taken care of. A fresh pour of pint is is always my my preference. Some of that might be the freshness of the beer. More often than not, it might be unpasteurized. You know, assuming it's in like a beer clean glass. You know, it hits the bar right in front of me. There's a lot of things going on outside of just the beer itself, right? It's a full sensory experience. Um, you know, the tough thing when we're trying to compare, because a lot of people ask bottle versus can versus draft, is you know how is it handled? You know, you could have a fresh bottle of, of beer that's a week or two old. It's been stored cold out of light. It could be fantastic. It could taste just as good as a freshly poured pint. Um, same thing with a can, but you know, the, the issue with beer and that a lot of people aren't aware of is there's all these kind of pitfalls along the way that can make a beer going, go from being at its absolute prime condition to not tasting its best. Um, and that can happen to draft beer, but that can certainly happen, happen to bottle and can beer. But if I, if I got one answer, you know, all things are, are equal, I'd probably go with a freshly poured pint of draft beer. I want to make deep. Uh, nowadays, you know, there is a trend, draft cocktails, draft on wine, tap on wine. What do you think about that? I mean, from a uh, method of dispense and maybe more for the account in terms of, you know, inventory control, uh, maybe even like increasing their margin on uh, their poor, poor cost. I don't have a problem with it. Um, but I still think that when we think of all things draft, beer is still, is still the leader. Uh, because, you know, people expect it. That's really where beer uh, comes to life at its best. Um, so I have no issues with draft wine, draft cocktails. But for me, if I'm ordering a cocktail, I'd prefer to see the bartender start from scratch, you know, see all the ingredients going in there, see some stirring, see the pour, see the garnish. Um, so if it's a cocktail for me, I don't really want the draft option. Um, but Beer for sure. So can we say that you don't you don't believe the cocktail machines for home? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of them are already prepackaged, right? So I mean, I know in the U.S., uh, ready to drink cocktails is what we call them RTDs. Uh, people love them because it's taking a lot of the work out of their hands, you know. So cocktails are kind of different at home. You know, making a cocktail can. Can be a little bit of a process, right? You might need five, six, seven, eight raw ingredients. You might need shaker, ice, um, you know, your glass, uh, as opposed to just like cracking a beer and pouring it in. Like it's a little bit more of an intense process where if you're at a bar or a restaurant, somebody's doing all that work for you. So, you know, from, yeah, for, for me, if I'm at home and I'm making a cocktail, I have to make it because I don't have a bartender on the payroll at my house. Um, but if I'm out at a, a bar or a restaurant, you know, I would certainly prefer to see that made from scratch. Uh, Ryan, what is your favorite cocktail in a summer nighttime? Ooh, the summer nighttime. Well, 
I tend to gravitate towards uh, whiskey. So to be honest, a lot of times I'll just do bourbon on a, on a rock, maybe scotch on a rock. Um, but a lot of times if I am going to play around with it, I might go an old fashioned route, you know, use a, a bourbon, uh, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of bitters, nice kind of squeeze of orange. Um, just kind of a nice balance of, of flavors there uh, would probably be my go-to. I, I, I really want to discuss one topic with you. Uh, last week, I was in London and three weeks ago in Madrid, also in Sunday, I'm flying Madrid again. Uh, in Madrid, I saw something different. Uh, you know, in Spain, like, there are four big companies. Uh, three of them is local, one of them is global. And one of the big local makes something interesting. Uh, they are opening tap rooms in Madrid and Barcelona. Uh, is they are not selling to, let's say, let's say Estrella Dam on a bar. They are selling alcohol, yeast, and hope. And there is a machine. It makes the mixation and customization in real time. Okay, yep. and they have eight different tabs, and they give the name New York, Singapore, Tokyo, etc. Yep. And it's there. one of them has more alcohol and less hope. One of them, blah 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 blah. Uh, what do you think about this mixation trend? Where it will go? Yeah, you know, I, I personally haven't tried a lot of the kind of quick mix beers. I, I know what you're referring to. Um, so I'd probably need to do a little bit of a, a taste test to, to really have a, a good opinion. Um, but I'd, I'd be a little skeptical that it could really mirror, you know, the 100% experience that you're going to get from a, a beer that's brewed and fermented and over the course of two, three, four weeks. Um, but I think what we're seeing is consumers like choice, right? And they, they like to be able to kind of customize things. So I think from a consumer experience perspective, it's, it's kind of a novel idea, right? They kind of get to, um, you know, choose their own journey, so to speak. Whether or not the end of that journey is really worth it, I can't say. Um, but I definitely need to try some of them. I'm curious, did you, did you have any? Did you, did you like them? It's okay. So, see, <laughs> yeah, not the real thing. Yeah. So, I, and I still don't understand the mathematic behind of it. Yeah. Even though I asked the creator of them, I got a kind of mainstream answers, you know? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> right. As a, as a technology maker in beer industry, one of the co founders of the, one of the main players. I always thinking about the uh, home consumption, of course, even though Pavino now focuses on internet of beer on hospitality industry. Of course, our vision, one name, homes. And uh, we are following on the trends. And you know, especially Generation Z, Generation Z is very important and very different. By the way, I don't know how are you, what is your situation? I don't ask, don't worry. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you if you want, it's okay. <laughs> For Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you yeah, know, keep, keep... sorry, Generation Z, uh, I'm working with them, is totally different for Generation Y. Uh, they are more than politics, but they are politics, for example, not being about right on left. Their, pol their politics is about to being belong to a community like vegans, LGBT, you know, they're, or according to some research, they are trusting uh, companies more than governments. And uh, their ratings from the companies, some behaviors on that side. Also, the main thing is being yourself. On that point, being yourself, but a cool word, right? 
uh, on that point, mixation and customization uh, is one of the main things. Uh, you know, there are so many uh, home brewing machines, let's say. Uh, so home brewing startups, blah, blah. What do you think about the customization of beer taste in the near future? Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think the good thing right now is, you know, at least in the U.S., we have over 9,000 breweries. So any, basically any city you're in is going to have dozens of breweries. And a lot of those breweries might focus on different things. So you're already going to have access to dozens and dozens and dozens of beer styles just by exploring your local brewing community. Um, so I think some of that is already out there that you don't necessarily need to recreate that at home. You might need to do a little bit of work to find what taste, flavor, what brewery fits with you. It's kind of going back to your point around identity and self-expression and finding things that have shared values. I think a lot of that is already in the local community that they can, they can latch onto. Um, I guess kind of going to like this notion of mixing flavors, you know, we, we talk about, uh, you know, like mixing different spirits, uh, you know, blending wine, blending sour beer, you know, that's, that's kind of a fun little thing you can do with, with beer is if you have a few different beer styles, you can kind of mix and match and try and come up with some things that are, are unique to, to what you like. So I'll just give a, an example of, you know, if you take, basically, you know, a nice American IPA and kind of a unfiltered American wheat ale and blend those things together, you basically get a hazy IPA. So, you know, you can kind of play around with what are the basic tastes I like. I like beers that are sweet or bitter or sour. What are some of the flavors and aromas I like, whether they be tropical fruits, citrus fruits, you know, candy, baked goods, things like that. Um, I think there's there's definitely the ability for people to just play around on their own. It's not necessarily something that one company is trying to own or control, but if it's just somebody that wants to explore different mixes, different variations, uh, they can certainly do that on their own. But again, I think there's so much variety right now that a lot of that you'd be able to find um, by doing just a little bit of work in your in your market and doing a little exploration. Let's see what will happen. So uh, you, what do you, what do you think? I mean, you're trying to, you're trying to figure out something for at home consumption. Do you have any thoughts on what you're, what you envision, like what, what people would really respond to? Two things I know, Ryan. One of them, people are ready to pay more for the quality. That refers to craft beer revolution, actually. Okay. The other thing, customization and being yourself is one of the main, main thing in the mm -hmm. next term. And what else? What else? We will see. <laughs> <laughs> Time will tell. Time will tell. Uh, all right. By the way, uh, in August, I have a long trip with starting from Montreal, Toronto, Chicago, New York, and San Francisco. I would love to meet you in person in New York. I hope you bring me some great beer places. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about later. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me know. Give give me a give me a shot when you're making your way through. Yeah, yeah. I I will I will let you know about my exact calendar. All right. Let's come to magazine questions. What, what are your favorite beer pairings? Uh, uh, okay. We be pairing with the different foods. I mean, the options, possibilities are endless, but there has to be logic behind of it. Sure. Could you tell me a little bit more. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, trying to think of just one or two, but you know, I really like, uh, like a lot of hand foods, finger foods. So if I think of something like, uh, crispy fish tacos with a little bit of like, um, chipotle mayo, 
uh, with a nice like blonde ale, something that's got a lot of tropical fruit, maybe a little bit of malt sweetness, just to kind of help combat a little bit of that chipotle spice and heat. Um, you know, so like good blonde ale and we'll say spicy fish tacos is always a, a good one. I think beer and dessert goes really well. Uh, beer and cheese. So, you know, interestingly enough, um, you know, like big barrel aged stouts, like bourbon barrel aged imperial stouts and blue cheese, you know, both really high intensity. Um, the saltiness of the, the blue cheese tends to accentuate a little bit of the sweetness of the beer. Um, almost makes it kind of like creamy fudge like like fresh made chocolate fudge. Um, so those are those are a few that come to mind. But a lot about pairing beer and food. It's it's such a personal experience. You know, I just I tell people to to explore, play around. Um, but generally, you know, if I'm if I'm eating and drinking, you know, I, I love things that I can just get my hands on both. You know, hand on a pint, hand on a taco, hand on a pint, hand on a chicken wing. Uh, things like that. So Ryan, you will bring me to a taco and beer place in August. Huh? In I'll, just, I'll just feed you beers and tacos. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, last week, there was a, a street in South London. It calls Brim Mile. Uh, mm -hmm. All the craft breweries production centers on there. Also, they have tap rooms. Uh, I was in a Taco place also in that. Uh, it was great. It was great. You, you yeah. Know. Yeah. And some people, you know, you could get go like high end fancy dishes, but, you know, I, I think beer, one of the, the greatest things about it is it's just accessibility. Right. And so that's where it just, it really, for me, there's so many times where I'm, I might just be out for lunch and I'm only having one beer, or I might be at a bar and I'm eating right at the bar. It's not, you know, I'm sitting down for a, four course white tablecloth uh, dinner. Um, you know, certainly beer can play there, but a lot of times it's just relaxed setting, like good, simple food, good beer, and you don't need too much else. I'm thinking twice to saying a master Cicerone to this, uh, because whenever I say this, everybody say, mm. but for me, one of the most pairing is kimchi and a light layer kimchi with a light layer I yeah love it. I yeah love it. and that's the thing i mean you you find things that that really work for you and just have at it um, yeah right. you, last but not least right how do you see the future of draft beer in Astra? i mean it changed a lot throughout the history especially the after in the last 20 years, but now the shifting technology is almost disrupting everything. Uh, how do you see the future of draft beer when you take into the account the hospitality trends today? What startups like us do? Especially, I mean, for example, in London, as I told you, there is a craft beer revolution. You can drink extremely great beers, but if you go to Soho, in a mainstream pubs, sheet beers, man. Yeah, mostly sheet beers. Yeah. Uh, especially, you know, in their uh, bars make their cleaning operation themselves. And the one of the biggest pain in the industry is the turnover of the bartender because of the pandemic and they don't know, mm -hmm. etc. So uh, the main question behind of this, where is the technology? in the draft beer and what should it be as a master system yeah you well, have a, if you have yeah. a limitless source if you have a limitless source yeah what do you do yeah well I, I feel like you're you're trying to lead me to an answer here that's gonna be a nice nice uh pub for you but yeah i think i think the future of draft beer is good it's it's bright you know certainly it was tough during the pandemic where a lot of bars and restaurants were closed um, I mean, draft beer took a huge hit, but um, as people start uh, getting back out, going back out, you know, we're filling taps again. Um, that's great. I think, again, as, as more and more breweries open up uh, across at least the U.S., that's a great way to expose people to draft beer because a lot of breweries are going to primarily serve draft beer. 
where, you know, if we go back 10, 15 years and you had, you know, a half, a third of the number of the breweries in your local market, more often than not, you're probably not going out and getting draft beer. So I think a lot of it is just people uh, having more opportunities to experience beer on draft and see what it can look like. Uh, I think also the more we educate consumers on what good draft beer is and what bad draft beer is will be a, will be a big piece. And that's kind of a role that, that we play because a lot of people may not understand. They might order a pint of draft beer and that beer is flawed, right? And that flaw might be driven by the type of system that the beer is being served on, right? The, the customer doesn't necessarily think it's the draft system's fault or the account's fault. They think it's the brewery's fault. So as we kind of educate customers of what should be there, what shouldn't be there, you know, as customer expectations evolve, the accounts, the retailers are going to have to ensure that they're putting their, their best foot forward. I think for me, like perfect world, it, it comes down to sanitation, you know, is, is whatever we have to do to have like clean, fresh draft lines, um, whatever that technology is, and it exists, some of it's just more manual. I know you guys are working on things that are more automated, which is, which is great because it's, it's a labor intensive process, right? So, uh, you know, probably the biggest opportunity for draft beer from my perspective is just ensuring a more complete coverage of well-maintained, well-clean draft systems, because that ultimately gets the, the right beer in the glass that the brewer intended. And that's ultimately what we're here for. Right. Thanks for your words. Actually, our vision is not only about to, uh, what word to use? Intense. Uh, intense sanitation, state. quality, yeah. Uh, Cleanliness. We are, we are mainly focusing on you are the master of it. You know, every beer type has needs different mm -hmm. cleanings. Yep. So with our AI system, uh, we have a chance to provide the different cleanings for each different beer type. Also different serving, different dispensing for each beer type. This is one of our uh, main focus area. That's mm -hmm. why behind of us there are seven patents. I hope it will be more. Um, it. I hope we will be industry standard. I'm not talking about the pavino. I'm talking about the technology will be industry standard because uh, our vision is serving perfect beer to all over the world. If something, if, if someone more doing that, I'm very open to that. We are yeah. we are loving beer. Yeah, I'm very sincere. Yeah, no, it's it's great. I uh, was looking at, uh, is it Aqua Vibra? Is that what you call the technology? Uh, we have three products. Smart Clean, yeah. We are building Internet of Beer. And we are doing this with three different products. Smart Tap, Smart Up, and Smart Clean. Smart okay. Tap is world first AI-powered beer tap. Yep. Uh, it arranges the beer flow and no spillage and standardize the quality. Smart Hub is a data platform where you can track the footprint of the nightlight. And Smart Clean, automated cleaning uh, device. Uh, you know Hippocrat? Uh, yeah. Hippocrat, uh, the, the, the um, doctor from the Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. he, has a, he has a very famous word. Uh, let me translate how he says that. He says that uh, hasta, uh, oh yeah, I couldn't translate it. <laughs> Don't worry. No, that sounds good. I mean, I would say that um, the smart clean is, uh, you know, I could see it being very useful. Uh, the managing the flow rate and minimizing waste is big, especially for those people pouring beer. Um, you know, just being able to pour the right amount of beer with the right color of foam uh, every time is a, is a good thing for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, I remember the word. He says that there is no illness. There is a patient. So you have to customize it. As in the clinic of the beer lines, you have to do that uh, according to volume, according to beer type, according to land. You have to arrange to 
cleaning process. Are the guys doing that? Uh, so it creates such a great results. That's why now our technology is in using in more than four four cities in six different countries and doing by more and more. But as I as I said to you, our main goal is serving perfect beer all over the world. So whoever puts some effort on this point, we are open to share our know-how and collaboration. So this session is one of the most important part of it. So thanks again for it. It's very fruitful. Mm -hmm. All right, one more question. What do you think about the hygiene and health conditions in drug beer systems, which have increasing in importance with the pandemic uh, and how do you see the future about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, unfortunately, probably a lot of draft systems were dormant during the pandemic and weren't cared for. So you probably had a lot of what we would call we beasties uh, building up in there. Um, you know, and it's tough to say how many accounts kind of took the time to properly clean, bring that system back online and in the right way. Um, but hopefully now that at least where we are, bars, restaurants have been open for quite some time. That's that's been caught up. Um, but it's a it's a huge issue. I think the problem is there's no there's no set expectation. Like honestly, for me, I would love to see it almost be a, a regulation that draft lines need to be cleaned. You know, we give recommendations of how often and what with what types of solutions. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a food product. It's being served to people. People are consuming it. Like I'd, I'd love for someday for it to essentially be almost built into health and safety standards that if you're serving draft beer, you need to maintain the, the quality, the sanitation, the cleanliness of that system. Um, but we're not there yet. That's a little bit of a, a pipe dream. Um, but I've, I haven't come across too many really bad pints in the last few months. I'm sure I'm sure they're out there, um, but yeah, it's it's an issue. And hopefully, as we think about you know draft beer in the future, kind of getting to the last part of your question, it's it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for somebody with technology to step in. It's an opportunity for customers to step in and you know really request or expect from retailers uh, what's coming across the bar. Um, it's an opportunity for all of us in the industry, regardless of role, to ensure that, you know, draft beer is, you know, always uh, served in the best possible light, in the best possible fashion. It's going to take a lot of work because uh, it's, it's a lot of people that have a hand in it, um, but I see it more as an opportunity. So hopefully we'll get there. Hopefully, hopefully, because the humanity needs a perfect beer. Uh, hey, amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my questions are done. Uh, it's a great session and it's my pleasure to be with you. Uh, if you have any questions, we can keep on. Yeah. No, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to see what you and the team are doing. Um, you know, I think the things you're focused on around, you know, cleaning systems, like, perfect pours, minimizing waste. These are all really big factors that uh, come with serving draft beer. Um, hopefully you guys are finding some good solutions, getting some traction. And if it's not you, hopefully there's other people out there um, that are chasing your tails. Cause I, I think it's a good mission um, and a lot of opportunities for some good work to, to be done. So uh, best of luck and you know, hopefully we'll, we'll enjoy a beer sometime together. And see you in New York. Yeah, you got it. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks for your time. Enjoy. See you.